Welcome to The Presence Project. This is episode 72, and I'm your host, Summer Joy Gross. I'm a spiritual director, an Anglican priest, and I have a book coming out this April, April 30th, called The Emmanuel Promise, Discovering the Security of a Life Held by God. So I had the immense privilege of homeschooling my kids for quite a few years. And one of our favorite times of the day was the read aloud time. I love reading stories over them, stories that I hoped would um, would put the furniture in the imagination of their brain. I don't know if that makes sense, but I always thought about it that way, that each story would provide uh, a place, kind of create home for them, a sense of home, a sense of um, the wonder of the world as well. So Today, I'm going to be reading to you from the Emmanuel Promise, the very first chapter or the introduction, and it's called His Face Turned Towards You. I'm going to be reading this all in one sitting, so I'm not going to cut out any. It'll be just like a read aloud. I'm not going to be producing this. I'm going to be reading it over you. Transitions can sometimes reveal the hot potholes of our internal world. Sometimes they can create them, but stories wired into our brains in adolescence can become hard to wire out. In adolescence, our brains are porous, moldable. My story may not be a story of abandonment or the death of a parent, but it's my story. The story of a young girl's vulnerability in four years of loneliness and hypervigilance. Four years of little t trauma. Not all stories of trauma have a shock factor. Some are slow, a twisting and ringing out over several years' time. In this case, four. Therapists talk about big t traumas and little t traumas. Big t traumas are events a death of a loved one a rape, a divorce, little t trauma signal an internal bruise, a repetition of hurt, a lie compounded, an atmosphere of shame, all unseen ticks on the page of an autobiography, but still tender. Little t traumas create the neural pathways, roadways in our brain that all other relationships travel down. This formation of neural pathways begins in the first three years of our lives as the quality of our attachment with our first caregiver is established. And this is what I want you to hear. Every experience we have with our main caregiver creates expectations for future care. In fact, it sets up our expectations for care for all of our relationships going forward, even our relationship with God. Traumas of all kinds can rip and tear at a secure attachment, leaving a new story in its place, a story ruled by shame, by fear, and by rejection. When I was 10, my family made a simple cross-country move, a common occurrence in many families. We stuffed the U-Haul, drove 16 hours from the rugged rocks of the southern main coast where my dad had been a surgical resident, and unpacked in the flat cornfields of northern Ohio. My dad was going back to his roots. His ancestors had been given land in Huron County as a part of the Firelands, which was an act of Connecticut legislature. After the British had burned their town during the Revolutionary War, his family was given 168 acres to farm. Centuries later, we were retracing their route from New England back to that same county in Ohio. 
In moving back home, dad was keeping a promise to a doctor who has funded his first year in medical school in Italy. He had asked dad to return to provide care for their small town hospital. Dr. Kaufman had passed away, but dad believed promises were made to be kept. Since then, I've learned how traumatic a move like this is in the life of an adolescent. Research shows that moving is the third most stressful event after the death of a loved one and divorce. Before the move, each day of fourth grade, my teacher in Portland passed out black and white modeled composition notebooks and set an egg timer for 30 minutes of delicious silence. The only rule? We had to keep our pencil tip on the paper. My page was filled with poetry featuring rainbows and short stories only a fourth grader could love. I used the page to lament and whine, to process and adventure. I learned to play on the page. I learned to pray on the page. On the first day of fifth grade, I pushed through a large metal door of my new private school in Celeryville, Ohio, a farm village lined with basketball hoops. I was sporting baggy plaid overalls, a clipped mane accent, and an awkward smile. I said things like wicked good and aunt, not aunt. That first day, I was called a clown, made fun of for my accent, and informed that my high tops were so very last year. Please read that last line in the accent of a valley girl while flipping your permed ponytail over your shoulder. When I got home that afternoon, I hid the overalls in the bottom of my toy chest along with any hope of an easy adjustment. I was in Anne of Green Gables in a Hoosier's world. I was bullied one small dig at a time, and where other children may have been able to laugh it off and launch it back, I had no such shield, no such skill. Recesses were spent on the volleyball court with the cliched picking of sides. Do I hear you groaning? Put a hundred junior hires in a room, and fifth grade me would have won at the game of awkward. The ball stung when it slapped the tender insides of my arms, and I rubbed the sting. The looks and eye rolls stung too, but I never learned to rub their tenderness away. These were tall farm-grown people. Their Dutch grandparents had ingeniously drained acres of swamp and discovered some of the most fertile land in America. They called it the muck. They were smart, entrepreneurial farmers. My classmates worked the fields in the summers, pulling green onions beside migrant workers from Mexico. They worked long hours in the sun and came back in the fall with a dark tan and a new vocabulary they were dying to try out. The houses in the village were lined with basketball nets and dads came home in the evening to play horse, H-O-R-S-E, with their kids. Three of the girls in my class reached six feet tall in the sixth grade and mastered the effortless layup. They had the gift of a village. Aunts, uncles, cousins. They were surrounded by group identity, a shared story, a common mission. They had never before known the anxiety of being uprooted. Now, as a mom, I see that farming village in a completely different light. It's exactly the type of place I would have wanted to raise my own kids. 
open doors, safe families, dads who drove white pickup trucks to the nearby fields, moms who made peanut butter and jelly sandwiches on the kitchen counter for the kids to grab on summer afternoons. On Sunday mornings, inside the red brick Christian Reformed Church across from the school, families sat down in familiar pews. Sunlight streamed through the long windows and bounced off white wood. Moms pulled square mints out of their purse before the sermon was preached. The children were known and embraced by a generous childhood. But what's paradise for one person can be torment for another. Perhaps I was like the little matchstick girl, always looking in the window at a continual feast, but never invited to take a seat at the table. When my family and I drove west, our own strong main routes tore. For five years, we had gathered at Jerry and Mary Goodall's house on Sunday nights for small group Bible study. This group held us together in their generous arms as dad spent 100-hour work weeks at the hospital training. We held hands as we sang the doxology in four parts, voices bouncing off the slate floor in the entryway. Casserole dishes, plates of cucumbers from the garden, traditional brown bread, and B&M baked beans with hot dogs circled the table. All the kids walked in and out of the teachings in the kitchen, snacking on spice cookies and drinking milk from small Tupperware cups. I sat in mom's lap as we learned about the Psalms, or I sprawled across the floor napping on a couch pillow while the guitar was strummed. Now here I was, 16 hours away in Ohio, wondering where my village was. Early Morning, every morning before school, I slid open the minivan door and walked into the small Christian school in Celeryville. I wondered how to stay small enough to survive until 2.45 p.m. Hour by hour, I stayed on a seesaw of fight or flight. Every night, I strategized how I would build bridges Maybe I would compliment a girl on her new shirt from the limited. I would pray for a smile, pray for friendship. I contemplated bringing extra chocolate chip cookies in my lunch to hand out. Nice became my coping mechanism. My strategy and my surprise attack, but the connection never lasted long. I tried to comprehend this new culture in the language where facial expressions, the mannerisms, the elbows slammed on the table, the huffing, the eye rolling. After four years of this, hypervigilance was carved into my nervous system. We all need a safe pair of eyes to land on when we're moving into fight or flight. We regulate our emotions through glances of kindness. We look for someone who knows us, someone who carries the truth of our value, someone who holds us in friendship when we're in a swirl of anxiety. Each day I walked in alone, a thousand nerve endings awake on my skin. For four years, I lived without the safety of a kind pair of eyes. Our brains need attunement like they need nourishment. We need someone to mirror our hurt back to us and say, ouch, I see your pain, and I'm not going anywhere. Attunement occurs when one person reads or tunes into the inner world of the other person with understanding and support. This is vital, especially for children. Why? A child is not able to regulate their emotions on their own. 
Their caregiver provides the empathetic presence the child needs to begin to make sense of their fear when awakening from a nightmare. Their pain is right-sized only when the child gives it voice and then experiences the empathy in their caregiver's eyes. When a child feels seen and understood by their caregiver, they feel safe enough to metabolize the emotion. Without attunement, the child either revs up their emotion to a higher degree or they begin the process of numbing because the emotion is too much for them to handle on their own. With attunement from their caregiver, the child eventually learns to internalize the caregiver's compassion, to self-regulate, and to use the caregiver's brain as the first map of their emotions. Neuroscientist Dr. Daniel Siegel uses four S's to describe what we need to feel when we are reaching out for attunement. We need to feel safe, seen, soothed, and secure. Years after our move to Ohio, I recognized the same disintegration I experienced walking through those metal doors while watching a video of Harvard professor Ed Tronick's still face experiment. Tronic's research into attachment, which revealed the quality of the bond between the child and the caregiver, helped further our understanding of attachment theory. The more secure the bond, the more the child was able to grow up moving about in the world with a sense of safety, wonder, and ease. So in the video, A mom mirrored her one-year-old daughter's laughter and curiosity and attuned to her emotions. When the little girl pointed, the mom looked and laughed with obvious delight. When she reached for her mother from her seat in her high chair, the mom laced their fingers together. The mom was attuning, constantly reading the signals, the emotions, and the needs of her daughter. Next, at Dr. Tronick's instruction, the mother turned her face away and stripped all emotion from her expression. When she turned back toward her daughter, she showed a face devoid of any hint of awareness or connection, called still face. But still face is not neutral. In the video, the young girl made facial expressions expecting her mother to respond. She tried to grab her mother's attention by pointing playfully, laughing, and engaging. Finally, after two minutes, the infant's shock turned to confusion, and then grief and anger, and then finally, total emotional mayhem. She went limp. She would have slid in onto the floor if she hadn't been firmly clicked into the high chair. Finally, she screeched and banged on the tray. The emotional stress caused her to fold in on herself. Man, can you feel that in your gut? The search for a face engaged. I sure can. It's one of our greatest needs and the source of our greatest fear, the shame of everyone turning away. We fear being alone in a crowd because every face around us has become still face. But here's my question. How many of us experience God as still face? How often do we believe he's emotionally unavailable in the middle of our being tossed by great waves that we have to yell, repeat our needs ad nauseum, find the right words that will act as an incantation or prove our worthiness? Do you think that's how the disciples felt in Luke 8, 22 through 25, when a storm started tossing their boat like a plastic vessel in a toddler's bathtub. 
and Jesus was sound asleep. He was exhausted from days of teaching on the mountain, healing Peter's mother-in-law, and tending to the townspeople's abundant needs pressing in all around him. I can imagine that being on the open lake with a few safe people sounded like just the sort of peace Jesus was looking for after compassion had wearied his body. I wonder if where is your faith was more like, do you still not know me? Do you not believe that I will never leave you helpless? Our greatest fear is being abandoned, that God will be absent or asleep when we need him most. Our great deepest need then becomes a question. Will I be safe, seen, soothed, and secure when life has me flat on the floor? Over and over throughout scripture, God's response is, I am with you, embodied in Emmanuel. God with us is not just a tagline. It is God himself with us in the mess and mire of our lives. God with us is the promise of an available and attuned caregiver. Turn towards us, his ear open to our every cry, not from afar, but right here in the room. Divine love, then, is not ephemeral, gone here today and gone tomorrow. It is the solid promise of a face always shining towards us. The invitation of this book and, of course, of our lifetime is to become awake and aware of love always reaching out. So let's pause for a moment to connect this to our own stories. When you walked into the room as a child, how did your dad greet you? Imagine your dad after work sitting in the corner on his laptop or behind a stack of paperwork on his desk. Now peek around the corner and yell, Daddy! What happens? What does his face look like? Do you run in and jump onto his lap? Do you keep your distance? Do you wonder if he heard you? Does he scowl? Does he put his index finger up, letting you know he doesn't have the time right now? Now imagine walking into a room where God is at work. What happens? Does he put out his hand and ask you to wait because he's busy? Or does his face light up as he holds out his arms and welcomes you with eagerness? Next, visualize walking toward God the Father with the brokenness of your sin still in your arms. The aftermath of your rage still knotted in your stomach. Your computer with pornography still open. Jack Daniels still on your breath. Your words slurring as you stumble forward. Now tell me what his face looks like now. The prodigal son was expecting full-on wrath. He had humiliated his dad, asking for his inheritance even before his father's death. And now he was crawling back home hungry after gambling away his dad's legacy in a Middle Eastern Vegas. He could no longer afford even a four-for-four from Wendy's. He got a job at a pig farm and spent his days smelling like pig slop as he considered sharing their food and laying down to sleep. In complete desperation, the prodigal limped home, remembering his dad's servant didn't have to root through the trash for supper. 
As he got closer, he rehearsed what he was going to say, fully expecting to hear an I told you so or get out of my sight. He expected still face, but instead his father's face looked like a sunrise, full of complete and utter joy, nothing but welcome. Before the son could even repent, his father threw a coat over his son's dirty jeans and t-shirt and phoned home for steaks to be put on the grill. He was expecting wrath from his father. Maybe you were too. Maybe he was expecting a dressing down ending with a slammed door. Maybe you were expecting an icy presence. Hands on hips with eyebrows raised in the word, again, thrown in your direction. Maybe you were just expecting disinterest. God's attention is limited, right? He doesn't have the ability to look up every time you walk into the room. Deep down, you believe he's busy elsewhere, somewhere more important. All of this is what a spiritual director calls helpful information. But don't worry, you're not being graded. Knowing more about our expectations around discipline and care helps us learn more about what we can expect or what we already expect in our experience of God. Every Tuesday during the summer before I went to college, I walked through the door to Trudy's office in a repurposed white clapboard house in Norwalk, Ohio, and sat down. Trudy, a marriage and family therapist, had been trained at nearby Ashland Seminary to pray her Christian clients through trauma. She taught me to go from a sense of safety, in my case, a couch in our family room to a memory, and then watch it unfold in front of me and ask God, where are you in the room? How do you feel about what's happened to me? Slowly, my memories were being transformed as I watched Jesus weep with me. As I prayed with Trudy, I remembered pushing open that large metal door to my junior high. But this time, Jesus walked into my fifth grade classroom, set up a cross, and got up on it. I was stunned, silenced. Christ on the cross took my breath away. There was nothing more that needed to be said. I couldn't put this prayer experience into words for a long time, but every time I thought of the school building or even dreamed of it, the cross was now there in the fifth grade room. Every time I saw myself pushing through those heavy doors, I was going to visit Jesus, and he was declaring, this place is mine. I hold the power here. The tree of life had been planted. The roots were spreading the kingdom through my memories. Somehow this message also endowed me with value. I heard him say, she's mine. I died for this one. Encountering Christ's presence in this place of hurt transformed my junior high experience from one of shame to one of safety and security. If I walked into any of the rooms in the school in my memory, the power of the cross completely shifted my emotions in the present. I was secure. Emmanuel, present, was the only message I needed. He was the final word. My internal earthquake ended in his presence. Years later at the Advanced Formational Prayer Conference in Ashland, Ohio, I sat at a round table facing Dr. Ann Halley, a spiritual director, professor, and practitioner in this realm of attachment with God. 
The fluorescent lights were strong, but the autumn light pouring in through the windows of the conference room was even stronger. That day, Anne wore a blue sweater in her characteristic warm smile. It was 2010. Anne was teaching us how becoming aware of our attachment with our first caregiver still affects our relationship with God. During our session, she invited us to ask the question, Jesus, where are you in the room on my behalf? As I prayed, I sensed Jesus was far away in the corner, but near in his attentiveness. He was turning towards each of us in delight. In fact, he was turning towards me in delight. I was experiencing the Emmanuel, God with us, holding my gaze with tenderness. The room stopped spinning. My breath deepened. My shoulders dropped. In the midst of a full conference room, my orientation shifted from overwhelmed to grounded. Christ is here, I thought. He who holds the world in the palm of his hand is present. As I opened up my awareness to the Emmanuel's presence, I experienced feeling safe, seen, soothed, and secure. What if we could experience an attachment with God so grounding that we feel safe in every room because we are oriented to his anchoring presence? What if we learn to stop at every threshold, take a deep breath, and ask, Jesus, where are you in this room? And then, as we step into the space, we join the one who is perpetually welcoming his children. That day, I began to comprehend what the disciples learned that stormy night on the Sea of Galilee. Peace is a person. And when we are aware of his presence, waves of anxiety are stilled. I also learned that coming awake to this truth is our chief work. Author C.S. Lewis said, We may ignore, but we can nowhere evade the presence of God. The world is crowded with him. He walks everywhere incognito. And the incognito is not always hard to penetrate. The real labor is to attend, in fact, to come awake, still more, to remain awake. Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection, the author of the letters that became the classic text, The Practice of the Presence of God, said, I cannot understand how religious people can live contented lives without the practice of the presence of God. For myself, I withdraw as much as I can to the deepest recesses of my soul with him. And while I am thus with him, I fear nothing. But the least turning away from him is hell for me. Then Brother Lawrence invited us to form this habit. In the beginning, a persistent effort is needed to form the habit of continually talking with God and to refer all we do to him. But that after a little while, his love brings us to it without any difficulty. Over the last decade and a half, I've asked myself this question daily. How would my anxiety today shift if I awaken to God's presence, the promise of Emmanuel? What if I could be safe, seen, soothed, and secure? Because Jesus' face was always shining towards me, always attentive, always connected. Like a dancer doing pirouettes while focusing on a clock in the back of an auditorium, could I orient myself on a clock in the back, orient myself to the presence of my Emmanuel, eyes trained on the one who is always attentive to me? Psychologists who study attachment theory have described secure attachment as a bond between child and caregiver where there is trust that care is 
available. So I began to wonder if I could experience the building of a secure attachment to the Almighty God. Dotted throughout the Old and New Testaments, the presence of God was provided as the security of God's people for their safety, their peace, their comfort, and for the ultimate encouragement that the God of the universe walked right beside them. Throughout the Gospels, we see that in the presence of Jesus, stories are transformed, people are fed, the dead are raised, storms stilled, and darkness flees. Rooms shift when we become oriented to the presence of our Emmanuel. But here's the question we must ask if we seek an attachment, a secure attachment with God. Has this concept of Emmanuel become so overly familiar that it has become lodged in our logical left brain and is never given the capacity to form the basis of our security in the world? Said another way, Have we kept the promise of Emmanuel at a distance because of its familiarity? What if you were hearing the following scriptures for the first time? So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. From Isaiah 41, 10. Or, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Joshua 1 9. Then there's the very last words of Emmanuel spoken before he ascended into heaven Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Matthew 28 20. Add to these a thousand other invitations through scripture of God inviting us to walk with him, to grab hold of his hand, to look in his face, and on and on. Somewhere along the line, we've got to ask ourselves, did he mean what he said? Or was it just an inane comfort he was throwing our direction before escaping into the heavenly realms? Brother Lawrence didn't think so. He was transformed by the awareness of God's presence. This was a question he was asking in practicing the presence of God. I cannot imagine how religious persons can live satisfied without the practice of the presence of God. For my part, I keep myself retired with him in the depth of the center of my soul as much as I can, and while I am with him, I fear nothing but the least turning away from him is insupportable. Then he goes on to say, one need not cry very loudly. He is nearer us than we think. How do we remain awake to the presence of God? How do we orient our lives to the promise of Emmanuel? the living Christ walking beside us. Discovering the answers to these two questions is the journey between these two covers. It's also the journey between birth and death. So lace up your hiking boots, pick up your walking stick. I'll walk beside you. But first, a few practical steps with as we start down the trail together. One, you can access companion videos for each chapter at summerjoygrowth.com slash the-emmanuel-promise. 
I'll walk you through prayer experiences using the scriptures and Monday morning practicals and make everything as accessible as possible. All you have to do is push play. Remember, number two, remember God is the initiator. We'll talk a good bit about this later. He knocks, we open. Number three, lean on him. One of the most important prayers I've ever learned to pray is this, God, I don't have desire for you in myself. Would you give me desire for you? This keeps us from staying stuck in messages crafted by shame. He is the giver of every good and perfect gift, even the desire to grow. Number four, keep your pace slow. You're not being graded. People grow best at the pace of relationship. And then number five, find your people. Don't think you have to do this work alone. Maybe you have a group already set up for this sort of journey. Read the book together. Or you can join the Presence Project community and we'll walk together. Heaven is crammed with those who have come awake to God's presence and turned toward the sun as if warming themselves after a fierce New England winter. They are wrapped, held, embraced. We are living here on earth with the smallest viewpoint of the divine, filled with incessantly chattering ego needs, obsessed with safety and carrying the heaviness of a broken world on our shoulders. This awakening to the nearness of Emmanuel is a leaning in, a learning, a listening to one whispered invitation after another. Earth is filled with the footprints of those who have passed before us, yawning, stretching, emerging from the slumber of life to walk with our Emmanuel. The line stretches before us. St. Paul, St. Patrick, Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, Brother Lawrence, C.S. Lewis, and on and on. Throughout this book, we'll join them in the journey, listening as the Spirit whispers to us. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from your sleep. It was a privilege to read this over you, my friends. If this caused you to desire to, to lace up your boots, to, to have a sense of hope that living in the presence of Emmanuel is a possibility that a secure and earned secure attachment with God is a possibility. I just invite you to pick up the rest of this book, to pre-order this book wherever your books are found. Again, it's been a privilege to read to you The Emmanuel Promise, Discovering the Security of a Life Held by God. And now, friends, may you know today that you are being held in the hollow of God's hand. Have a wonderful day, friends.